This conference will now be recorded. Hello, welcome to the plot two course. So I'll take um, a while to take you through the introduction to the plot two test. Um, there are quite some salient um, points that we'll be going through today. They will help you understand how the plot two course is designed and um, what the expectations are of the GMC from you who will be sitting the test. So it's important that we have this um, conversation so we'll have a good bearing um, as to what to expect and what to prepare yourself with, um, not just in the course of this um, academy, but also when you sit the exam. Now we need to know what the plateau test is about and what it is not about. And the test is subjectively structured clinical examination, um, which means that each of the stations that you find in the exams have been designed objectively to test a particular set of skills as expected of a clinician or a doctor who intends to work in the UK. Now, of course, you know that this exam is organized by the General Medical Council which is a body, um, an agency of the United um, Kingdom um, government designated with the duty of um, regulating medical and dental practice in the United Kingdom. Now, of course, you know the PLAB exam, you have the PLAB part one, which I believe you have sat and you have successfully completed, and then you have the PLAB part two exam. So this exam is designed, yes, for doctors who want to work in the UK. Now, of course, there are a few other countries anyway who accept the PLAP test um, as a criteria or at least a pathway for coming into their countries to work. For some of them, the PLAP2 exams is just enough for them to register you. For a few others, it is just a step in that process. Now, the exam is about patient-centered care. It is the number one thing about this test. So they want to see your ability to focus on the patient and not on yourself, not on what you know, not on what you want, but on the patient. It will test your professionality, to test your attitude, your behavior as well. Will you be nice to the UK patients? Will you be kind? Will you be friendly? And of course, while doing all of that, will you maintain your professional boundaries? Now, to test you on your ability to maintain ethical principles, especially in difficult situations. There are those times when, you know, um, it takes a lot, of, it will take a lot of consciousness for you to um, look at the, the clinical scenario before you and maintain your professional, um, in quotes, cool. Okay, so um, you find, for an instance, stations on angry patients, you find stations on um, a patient or relative that's unhappy with hospital management, you find all of that. Those very unfavorable or not very comfortable um, settings. So how you are going to manage your emotions and keep to the ethical principles expected of you in those settings is one of the things the plot part two exam presented test. Now we also test your ability to understand the hierarchies in decision making within the medical practice. Okay, do you will you recognize the points where your competencies stop? Would you recognize the points where you need to call your seniors or at least where you need to inform them of what you have done? Would you be conscious about that? So they are going to test you on your understanding of hierarchy, you know, in decision-making within the clinical uh, 
environment. Now, the exam will also test your working relationship with colleagues. Okay, colleagues could be doctors, could be nurses, could be radiographers, could be medical students. It could just be anybody within the hospital environment. It could be management staff. So it will test you, of course, using certain scenarios that have objectively been structured to test your attitudes, your skills, your communication competencies while communicate colleagues. It will test you, of course, on drafting a good management plan. It is believed that having passed the plan pass for an exam, you have um, to a very good degree the clinical knowledge um, to manage a patient. So it will test you in drafting a good management plan based on what you know um, from the common conditions that you um, sat for in the plan pass one exam. Now, what is the plan part two exams not about? What is it not about? Now, don't forget that we talked about the plan part one uh, being a prerequisite for sitting the plan part two exam. Now, if you observe very correctly, you see that the plan part one exam is established on medical knowledge, clinical knowledge. You find a lot of fine details that you expected to, you know, um, wriggle around them and pick the right options. Of course, you're expected to know things even as tiny as some genetic components of certain conditions. You see a lot of theories in cardiology, respiratory system, and all the, all, all the other um, um, systems. Now, you were tested on knowledge. The plat part two exams is not entirely about knowledge. In fact, it's not even primarily about knowledge because it is assumed that you already have the knowledge. So coming to the plat part two exams, um, one should not focus on perhaps pouring out all the theories that you know about the condition that you find in each of these stations. Of course, if you do that um, and ignore the other aspects of the exams, you will like not do well. It's also not about language efficiency. It's not about um, how much of the English language you can speak. You know, so long as you can com communicate in simple terms, you should not be too conscious about making correct tenses or not. And the plan part two exam is not about experience. You have some doctors who are consultants, who perhaps are even professors and intend to move over to work as medical um, doctors in the UK. And with all the years of experience under their belt, they have it, uh, they find it very difficult to pass the PLAP2 test. You have, on the other hand, a couple of doctors who just completed their medical training or just have maybe one or two years experience working as doctors in their home countries. And then they come to sit for the PLAP2 exams and they pass at the very first attempt. So while experience is good, it may not give one an edge over the other in terms of the PLAP2 exams. So it's not about your experience, it is about some objectively designed competencies expected of a doctor. Now, the PLAP2 stations, yeah, there are a couple of scenarios, a couple of types of questions or stations that are designed to test these competencies. Now, we'll just look at some of them. One, you find full consultations spanning through history taking, examination, investigation, coming down to a diagnosis and of pulling up a good treatment or management plan. So you might find a station where you would have to do all of this. You might also find stations where you will predominantly be taking history. You may just have to mention the examination stations you would like to do, but you may not perform them. So the key thing in these stations would be taking that very good history and gradually tailoring it down to a good diagnosis. Of course, in most of the case, those kind of stations, the diagnosis are glaring. So your history taking would usually be enough to reach a diagnosis. And of course, then you move on to your management. 
you have stations where it is basically examination, clinical examination, of course. So you may be tested on how you perform chest examination, on how you perform cardiovascular examination, on how you perform knee examination, for an instance. And for some of them, it could be performed or tested on how you perform them on a patient or or your ability to teach them to a younger colleague. So it could be a medical student, it could be a nurse, it could just be anybody. So you have teaching stations, of course, where you may have to teach um, a particular procedure, you may have to teach a particular condition, you may have to interpret a particular result and help a younger colleague or another health worker who does not understand that particular result, your ability to communicate what the result means. So in that case, you are demonstrating your competency on that examination or on that procedure or on that result, but you are teaching another person. You have stations on clinical emergencies. Okay, it could be medical, it could be surgical emergencies, and how you respond to them will be tested. You might also have stations on clinical reporting, where you are expected to interact with the patient, and then you are expected to summarize your consultation to your to a senior. How do you report your findings moving from history, examination, what you think the diagnosis could be, or what investigations you think you need to do to reach a diagnosis? And perhaps, maybe, what the treatment you have recommended or would recommend for that particular patient. So in this case, you are not telling the patient yet what the management is. You are communicating to your senior what your consultation looks like. You also have ethics stations where you have scenarios that will test you on ethical principles and um, the other supportive details you know, behind those principles in practice. You find stations as well on communication skills, how you're able to explain an unhappy and um, maybe um, a result to patients or patient relatives how you are able to communicate with colleagues. There are stations like that that will test your communication skills. It can be mixed, of course, with other aspects of um, the earlier stations I mentioned. Like if you have ethical scenarios that are mixed also with testing your communication skills. Now, having sat for the exams, the plan part two has a marking structure and the examiners after the exams will also give feedback to each candidate that sits the exams. Now the marking structure will basically be telling you how you have performed for each station and how all of that culminates into whether you have passed the exams or whether you need to repeat the exam. Of course, if you understand how all of these operate, you stand a better chance of not having to repeat the exams. Because of course, you will conduct yourself um, with knowledge when you sit the exams. Now, the exam uh, is divided into three parts uh, in terms of scoring. So you have a domain one, you have a domain two, and you have a domain three. Each of these domains have a maximum scoring point of four each. Okay, so you have domain one, four points, domain two, four points, domain three, four points. Now, if you understand these domains and what each of them assesses, you stand a very good chance of working with some kind of orientation when you are in each station. Okay, so that means you would understand that you need to pick up scores from domain one, you need to pick up scores from domain two, you need to pick up good scores from domain three. And of course, it puts you in very good light and gives you a very good chance of passing your exams. Now let's look at domain one. Domain one tests will test you on your data gathering, your technical and assessment skills. How do you take your history? 
is your history organized? Is your history logical? Does it gradually pull up the relevant information that will lead you towards a diagnosis? What examinations do you think you need to do for this patient? Or how did you perform them? Practical procedures, investigation that's leading to a diagnosis. Out of all the things that you have listed you need to do for this patient to understand what is going on, do you, on the other hand, lay emphasis on the investigation that will lead to a diagnosis? So for an instance, you have a patient who has um, a chest infection. Of course, you know that in the many investigations you need to do, you need to lay some degree of emphasis on your chest X-ray. So how you display all of that will culminate into the scores that you will have for your domain one. It shows your data gathering skills, your technical and your patient assessment skills history taking, examination, practical procedure, and of course, stating the investigation that leads to a diagnosis. Now, in domain two, it will be assessing your clinical management skills. Now in domain one, you have been able to pull up information. You have been able to maybe perform the a procedure, and you have come to a point where you have come close to clinching what the station is about or what the problem is with this patient. So are you able to make a diagnosis? That means, are you able to make the right diagnosis first? Because this diagnosis has to be correct. Are you able to explain the diagnosis to the patient? Are you able to pull up a good management plan? Okay, so domain two will look at your diagnosis. Is it correct? Or in some cases, you may not have a specific diagnosis. Perhaps in that scenario, um, there could be a set of differentials. So did you pull up the right differentials? Yeah, there are, you find a few stations where um, they may tell you, discuss your differentials with the examiner. So in that case, there may not be a specific diagnosis. You might have two or three very likely things that may be the cause for these set of symptoms. And of course, these set of uh, findings in your physical examination of the patient. And these are the things you are thinking about. It's not very clear yet, but these two things, these three things. Okay, so there must be an appropriate range of differentials. Or in the case of a specific diagnosis, it has to be the correct diagnosis and you must take a moment to explain that diagnosis to the patient. Remember, it is patient-centered care. So if you have the right diagnosis and the patient does not know what that diagnosis is about, then the consultation becomes about you and not about the patient. And that defeats the purpose. You are going to score a lot less in your domain two then you need to pull up a management plan that reflects best international practices. That means it has to be holistic, considering the patient's physical, social, psychological, and occupational, and whatever else, um, care, emotional even, spiritual perhaps, so long as it applies to the clinical scenario you have with you. Now, it will also involve or include things as important as follow-up, things as important as giving a safety netting, you know, and, um, you know, um, a follow-up, yeah, safety netting, things like that. Now, in domain three, you will be assessed on your interpersonal skills to check how you approach the station from the beginning to the end. Did you establish your rapport with the patients? Did you use open and closed ended questions and did you use them rightly? That means, of course, while you are taking your history, you know, you should, yeah, you, you will, while you, of course, domain one scores are going on there, but domain three will also come into play. How did you use open and closed ended questions? Did you make the, the conversation open enough for the patient to explore 
you know, to express themselves and pour out their concerns, of course, explain everything the way they feel. And of course, do you use closed-ended questions to appropriately guide them towards a particular set of suspicions in the course of the conversation? Now, they do involve the patient in your management. When you have reached the diagnosis and you know, yeah, this is what we need to do for you, this is what we need to do for you, this is what we need to do for you. Did you seek feedback? Did you think of the patient's concern? Is the patient worried about that investigation? Yes, about that investigation. Does the patient have some concerns about so so and so prescription? Okay. Or does the patient even think they can stay in the hospital? Let's say you want to admit. So did you seek a feedback? Did you seek their input into your management plan? So while you are doing your domain two, you know, trying to structure an appropriate management plan, domain three is also taking a look at how you are doing that. And to look at how professional you maintain yourself throughout the station, and of course, how you understand ethical principles. So you find that ethics will almost always come into play irrespective of the station that you're looking at because interpersonal skills will look at your understanding of ethics. Now here we have a sample plateau result. So in a plateau station, you are expected to score above minimum score for that day and you're supposed to score at least 11 stations out of 18. At the moment, the GMC um, uses 18 clinical scenarios for each exam with two rest stations. So that makes it 20 stations altogether. So for two of them, you will be resting, catching your breath so you can continue the exams. But the active stations are actually 18. So out of that 18, you're expected to pass 11 and um, you should score above the minimum score required for that particular day. So for this doctor here, the, the, the doctor had 142, which is higher than the minimum score expected for the day, which is 123. Now this person also passed 14 stations, uh, which is higher than the 11 stations that is expected for each doctor to pass on that day. So that means this person completed the exam successfully. Now here in the table, you find the title of each of these stations. You find the domain one scores, the domain two scores, the domain three scores, and the total score for each of these stations. By it is the pass score needed for each of that station. So you see in the first station here, the person had a total score of six and needed 6.48 to pass. So of course, it is not up to the minimum score required for that station, so the person failed that station. But just after that, the same score of six, the minimum score expected to pass was 5.71. So the person had above the minimum score to pass that station, and of course that is a pass. Now after all of that, the examiners in each of the station will give a qualitative feedback to help the doctors improve themselves. So irrespective of whether you pass or whether you fail, they are still going to show you the areas where you were weak when you performed in those stations. So take for an instance here, in this third, in the third station on this slide, you have an elderly man with questions about his condition. Now, it shows that this doctor's consultation was a little bit flawed. He also had problems with his time management and all of that. So you see those boxes that were ticked for this doctor. There are areas where for this station, this person did not do so, so well under those areas. So it gives you room to reflect on them. Of course, you may not come back to sit the exam again if you have passed. Yeah, but it helps you to sit back and then, of course, work on how you approach scenarios or situations like that. Now we'll look at those 10 things that examiners watch out for. So you find that in the previous, uh, poly, in the previous table, where I looked at the qualitative feedback, you find that there were 10 columns. Those 10 columns are the 10 areas they look out for when you complete your station. 
So if you can do well in all of those 10, you will very likely do, you know, amazingly in your exams. Let's take an instance. We'll go back to that table. You will find here that for this decision, uh, um, knee examination so you find out that for this knee examination the first station on this table none of the boxes were ticked now if you go back to the scores just a moment you'll find that this doctor did very well in that station why he had it had nine out of twelve in that station you know, so if you conduct yourself in those critical 10 areas, the chances that you will score very high in that session is very, 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 very good. Now, what are the 10 things examiners watch out for in each station? Number one is the consultation. Now, I'll be taking time to explain each of them. Now, it looks at the structure of your consultation. The structure of your consultation. How have you organized your consultation? Was your consultation structured? You know, of course, you saw the an ideal consultation should be, of course, you, an initial approach. You come in to try to understand what is the complaint of this patient. You explore, of course, you take your history taking, and then you move on to an examination. If you need to perform examinations to understand what is wrong with that patient, you examine, and then you move on to either requesting for certain investigation that will help you reach a diagnosis, or you make a provisional diagnosis and move on to um, make it, requesting certain investigations that will help you understand this diagnosis or confirm it, you know, and then you move on to a treatment plan. So you see um, history taking, examination, a diagnosis, investigation, and then a treatment plan. So that means your entire consultation has a structure. So if you find a doctor that begins to mix up the whole station, uh, giving a diagnosis and then coming back to ask a few questions and then going back again to change the diagnosis and all the, the entire process is not structured it's not organized so it's not orderly so these are the things that we'll be looking out for when they take consultation this is person orderly is there a logical sequence between the approach that this doctor has uh, has adapted or adopted in that particular station Number two, we'll look at issues. Each station has a key issue. You know, it may be a diagnostic issue, it may be an ethical issue, it may be a social issue, it might be an emotional issue, an angry patient, an unhappy patient, and all of that. It could be an ethical issue, maybe confidentiality or the patient's autonomy. It could be something diagnostic, maybe a clinical condition. All of them are not about clinical situations. Some of them are about ethical issues. So they may be presented with a clinical scenario, but what is behind that station may be the ethical principle of this and ethical principle of that. It could be a social issue that's impacting on this person's health. And you must identify that the issue here is not the clinical diagnosis. The issue here is that social problem that is causing this clinical picture. It could be an emotional problem, somebody that is uh, maybe going through domestic violence at home and then is coming down with, uh, let's say, poor sleep. Okay. Now, the poor sleep, the insomnia, of course, those, you have, those are the clinical aspects. But the real issue is not the insomnia. The real issue is the domestic violence that is causing the insomnia. So you see how the examiner will be really looking out for your ability to identify the key issue in the station. So you may 
let's say for this last example I gave, you may see that, oh, this person has so on, so insomnia, or this person has a mild or moderate depression, and then you totally ignored what was causing it, the domestic violence history, violence history that this patient has given. So you, this box will be ticked for you because you were not able to identify the key issue in this station. So you must recognize it. Now, this is an example. Um, you might have a patient with giant cell arteritis, and then you are looking at all the clinical issues, all the all the tiny details about giant cell arteritis, all the theories, and yet the real concern of this patient is, doctor, will I see with this eye again? So if you do not in your management address this patient's concern, you have missed the, the, the patient-centered key issue in this station. While, of course, you might reel out all the treatments, all the theories behind treating or managing giant cell arteritis, but you must address that concern. You have another example here, maybe a transgender patient who is having pulmonary embolism, and all your focus is on the tiny details on how to manage pulmonary embolism or give oxygen, I will do this, I will do all of that. You know, we'll do a, a CTPA, we'll do and all the theories. And then what this patient is worried about is the hormone therapy that resulted in this pulmonary embolism. The, person, the patient is wondering, will I stop this hormone therapy? I want to transit from so-and-so gender to so-and-so gender and I've been placed on the hormone. So if you are saying this is what caused it, will I have to stop my transiting process? So the patient's sexuality as regards the hormone therapy is the key issue and you must address that. Number three is time, okay? Spending too much time on less important parts of the consultation is a big issue that many doctors face. You know, so you find a doctor, you know, looking at the ideal consultation, now history taking examination, diagnosis, and then to treatment or investigation before that, depending on the situation. Now you find that a doctor might spend as much as six minutes out of the eight minutes allocated for each station. The doctor might spend six minutes taking history. And then at the end of the day, the person is struggling to use the last two minutes to do examinations, to talk about investigations, to come to the management, and then the person is rushing. So that is poor time management. So you should not spend too much time on less important parts of the consultation. Now, that does not mean the history taking is less important, absolutely not. There are those scenarios where of course, it may be so much of history taking, and then there may not be needs for even the examinations to be performed in that station. So, of course, if you spend maybe five minutes taking history, and then you gradually taper down into your management and without rushing, that would be awesome. But based on the focus of that station, you should not spend time on less important part. So, more important parts of the of the station. Uh, not getting attention is a big problem. So you should take a focus history, assess patient and discuss management with the patient. Let's assume this is what the task is. So that means you have a history part, you have an examination part, and you have a management part. All of these three are expected of you in this station, if this is the task. So you should try as much as you can to balance your timing so that none of them will suffer. Now let's get to the fourth one, findings. Now you should be able to recognize abnormal findings in history taking, recognize abnormal findings in a particular result that the examiner might present to you. So if let's say you are given, uh, you are given um, a full block count result for an instance, and uh, you identify here yeah, that the HB levels are lower than expected, so yeah, there's some degree of anemia here, and then you did not see the MCV, or you did not demonstrate that you saw the MCV, that maybe the MCV is high. That, of course, gives some kind of specificity to the kind of anemia. It gives some better light 
into how you're going to manage this patient because with high MCV, these are the kinds of causes you will be looking at in terms of this anemia. Oh, or is it low MCV, okay? With the low MCV, of course, you are going to look at another aspect of anemia. So you should be able to recognize abnormal finding. Okay, so in your history taking, it could be important symptoms, it could be important information, you know, that will help you reach diagnosis. Yeah, so I explained this in the last example. Okay, so in your examination, you should be able to pick up important signs. Okay, let's say you have a patient with cholecystitis. If this is what you are suspecting at the time you are going for your abdominal examination, it is expected for you to perform the morphis sign, you know, for you to, to try to elicit that morphis sign. So it shows that you are looking for the key findings that will help you tie down this diagnosis. So it will not be enough for you to say, I would want to do an abdominal examination, okay? There are a million things that you can pick up in abdominal examination. But from the history, I'm beginning to think in this direction. So I would want to elicit a special test we call the Morphe's sign. Of course, you want to, in your lab results as well, you want to look at the relevant key findings like I just told us, all right? So, you must recognize the implications of some of these key findings. Yeah, where some of them have special meanings, you should be found, you know, to show your competence, to show your understanding of how important those findings are. Now, the next one is examination. Were you able to perform the examination in a proper way? Let's say for iphondoscopy or ophthalmoscopy, um, if a doctor uses the ophthalmoscope in the left eye to examine the right eye of the patient, of course, that will be awkward because you, by the time you are getting to the patient's face, you'll be moving face to face with the patient and you would likely you know, hit the patient in a very inappropriate way. So you must do it right. Were you able to you know, um, perform the mission in the right the eye to right eye, holding the ophthalmoscope appropriately and all of that. Now, were you able to use the instrument appropriately? Let's say for an instance, you pick up the ophthalmoscope or you pick up the otoscope and you, were not, you did not put it on, you did not put the light on and you did not demonstrate it, that you put it on and you are checking to see if the light maybe is working. Of course, you can't do a phonoscopy without the light on the, on the ophthalmoscope. You cannot do otoscopy without the light on on the otoscope. How would you see the back chamber of the eye? How would you see the, 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 the eardrums or, you know, from the canal as uh, uh, so It's not just inserting the instrument. So did you use the instrument appropriately? So all of these are things that that fifth box will be looking at. Number six in diagnosis, did you get the diagnosis correct? Okay. So in a case where you have a pneumonia and there are risk factors for, you know, maybe immunosuppression and all of that, things suggesting something as specific as pneumocystis carinae. So you can say, yes, I think you have a chest infection and um, it looks to me that it is not one of the common types. So I think it is a special kind or an atypical kind of chest infection most likely caused by a bug we call pneumocystis carinae. So this shows that you have a good understanding of what could be wrong with this patient. And you are trying to show that you, you duly and really understand what could be the cause for this patient. Now, in certain cases where the, the, the diagnosis may not be specific, it may not be just one thing, or even the task request that you just pull up differentials only. So you should be able to pull up the appropriate differentials. And this box will be looking at your ability to do that. So if you, your differentials are maybe not very appropriate or not quite close to the patient's presentation, then um, it puts you slightly in um, some negative light. And this box will be ticked for you to show that you did not do this properly. Okay. So 
these are just differentials for um, maybe a chess presentation. Now management. Number seven box would look at your management. Is your management plan appropriate for the condition? Now don't forget that some of these things are intertwined. If you did not get the diagnosis right, there is every chance that you will not get the management. So is your management plan appropriate for the condition the patient came with? Okay, is your management holistic? Does it reflect best international practices? You know, did you did you maybe give something like follow up? Did you after of course prescribing your management? Did you say okay, let me see you in one week's time, let me see you in three days time, let me see you in two weeks time, depending on the condition, okay? Or we're going to be seeing you as frequent as possible for the next one year and a half, for the next two years, to review your medication, to see how you have responded, to do a few more tests, to see how these abnormalities have improved, okay? Did you give things like safety netting? And what does that mean? You know, telling the patient things to watch out for, danger signs to watch out for, that in any case you find some of them, that you should come back to the hospital or you should let us know. So all of these, these things are things that reflect best practices. Did you inform your seniors, okay, to make sure that the patient is always put in safety? Okay, so these are the things that they will be looking out for. Let's say, for an instance, you have a patient who had a sudden fall at home and let's say maybe um, had an ankle sprain. Okay, so did your management, after giving painkillers and doing all of that, all the price regimen in the, in the academy, will talk about how to manage them. But after, after looking at the clinical management of the ankle sprain, did you look at things like rehabilitation? Does this patient need physiotherapy? Does this patient need an occupational therapist to look at the living conditions at home, to look at the working conditions at work, and to be sure that this patient is holistically made comfortable? So the management will be looking at all of this. Did you look at support? Maybe home visits for this elderly person who had a fall, had a colleague's fracture, has been, of course, the medical or surgical management has been done and this person is going back home, how would the person cope at home? Okay, so can we, should we arrange for home visits, you know, so we can see the person at home and see how we can help her? Or so so and so person who needed antibiotics and then um, is refusing management because he has some other engagements at home that will make him not want to stay in the hospital. And now, are you making room to see how you can maybe arrange for the antibiotics to be given at home, and of course, for a care worker to be able to visit at home to check on how this person is doing? Number eight talks about rapport. Rapport. Okay, so how did you relate with this patient? Did you establish a good doctor patient relationship from the start of the station? Did you show sincere sensitivity to the patient's concerns? Maybe this patient is in pain. How did you respond to that pain? Did you respond sensitively? And is it looking real? Does it look genuine? Does it look sincere? Okay. Or did you respond in ways that every other person has been responding? And it seems like a crammed response. Those are what we call stock phrases. Sometimes, you know, they are actually overused. Let's say for an instance, oh, so sorry. I'm so sorry for about this. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then you say, I'm so sorry, like four times, five times. It looks like you are repeating a rehearsed behavior. It doesn't look sincere. And while in content, it is empathetic, but in context of application, it is just rehearsed. So um, it will count negatively in terms of rapport. So did you show appropriate empathy? Did you go shaking hands with somebody who is in pain, somebody who is crying? Of course, that is, um, is, is so, it's awkward, it's out of place. So your empathy should be appropriate, okay? Your facial expressions, your body language, the tone of your voice while you talk in different settings or scenarios, situations, must be appropriate for those situations. Of course, you shouldn't be smiling when a patient is in pain or a patient is angry or a patient is unhappy 
while you should not be frowning of course and not be too tense and all of that your facial expression should be appropriate the person is in discomfort you should maintain it you know you maintain an empathetic and appropriate position towards that that um, discomfort so the rapport will also check your patient uh, your ability to involve your patient in your management plan now the next one is listening okay. did you use verbal and non-verbal cues you know and were you able to actually pick up verbal and non-verbal information that the patient is giving you the patient might be in distress might not say it verbally but may be acting it out through body language would you see it and you know perhaps say, I can see you're a bit uncomfortable, I can see that you, it seems you're a bit in pain, or I can see that you're not quite happy today, I can see that you're not quite impressed with the treatment that I was given. Okay, when you say that, and it was not, to, it, the, the patient did not tell you I'm not impressed, but you can see from the body language that this person is a bit restless, this person is a bit uncomfortable, this person is a bit unhappy, you are supposed as a doctor to pick up those non-verbal cues or in some cases they could be verbal okay for you to show active listening skills of course by giving feedback showing that i heard you and this is what you say for an instance giving a summary okay for an instance summarizing at the end of history taking so from what we have discussed so far um, you mentioned that you have fever, you had headache, you had this, you had that, you had that. You also mentioned that you were taking so and so medications and you had so and so conditions before now. So that summary shows that you were actually actively listening when the patient was talking, or when the patient was responding to your question. Okay. So it shows active listening. Now, your attention to patient's agenda, beliefs, and preferences. So if you ask questions, but you do not use the answers in your management, it shows that you're actually not paying attention, okay? Or the patient stressed the particular thing so much, and I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. And then in your management, somehow, you totally forgot what the patient was concerned about, it shows you are not attentive to the patient's concerns. Now, language. Okay. So, your language should be appropriate for the patient. It should be simple enough for the patient to understand. And this box will be looking at that. So, you should not use medical jargons. So, of course, you should call the diagnosis what it is medically. If the name is pneumonia, the name is tonsillitis, the name is uh, ankle sprain, the name is uh, viral encephalitis, whatever it is, you should call the diagnosis what it is. However, after that, you should be able to explain it in simple patient day-to-day -day language. Okay, so this means that you know you have a kind of chest infection which i think is affecting your small airways okay so i've tried to simplify the word pneumonia to chest infection and you know chest infection is quite broad so i'm trying to bring it down to where i think it could be affecting it could be your small airway bronchitis for instance for an instance affects the large airways okay and it is a kind of chest infection but that's not what i'm thinking about so you try to bring it down in patient's language. Simple, relatable, not technical. Now, for some people, they speak too quickly because they're a bit concerned about meeting up with time. They want to you know, manage their time. They want to finish everything before, you know, before it's time up, before they can move to the next station. So you should not really be seen speaking too quickly that you are not checking for the patient's understanding. You know, so the examiner will be looking to see if you are so focused on completing the station than attending to the patient. That makes it not to be a patient-centered consultation. It beats the entire purpose of um, the exam. All right, so now we'll look at quickly, we'll just run through. I've actually explained most of these things, but the common errors based on these 10 things. Now, under consultation, you find people who attend to their patients in a very disorganized, poorly structured manner. 
And then you find people who use a very logical approach. They, they don't have a bearing, they move from left, they come back to the right, they go back again and all that. You know, maybe perform an examination, then remember what they've not asked in the history and then they jump back again to take that history and all of that. There's a way to deal with all of that anyway. But when doctors do that in a particular station, it shows their consultation is not organized. Now, under issues, common problems would be not recognizing those key issues or being in a hurry and not highlighting those key issues. You know, if you highlight them, only then would the examiner really see or really understand that you got the concept or you got that hidden information or that slightly not obvious information. Okay. So they may miss the important the priority thing, and then they may spend time on the less important aspects of the consultation. Let's say spend so much time on history, and then the real finding that will help to clinch the diagnosis in the, in the examination. And then they did not do the examination. Of course, how can they proceed? So they might miss the key issues. Time management is always a problem. It's one of the common errors you find where they can't, you, doctors they can't maybe allocate time appropriately or control the time so much as to deliver all they can deliver within the specified time. Now, under findings, common errors is uh, missing the key or the finding findings in either the history, the examination, or the result. Let's say, for an instance, the, the, the transgender with pulmonary embolism who comes with definitely comes with all the clinical symptoms of a chest problem. Now, you spend a lot of time taking history of uh, maybe the cough or the difficulty in breathing and all of that. And somehow you did not see it all together that this person is on the hormone therapy. Now, you see that key issue, in fact, the key concern of the patient would be, I know, like I explained earlier, would be that, will I stop these hormones? So if you did not find out at all in your history that this person is on hormone therapy, how are you going to respond to that question? So that means at the time of your management, when you'll be talking with this patient about what I think we should do for this, your condition, then the patient asks you the question, eh, doctor, I'm on hormone therapy, can I? Everything disorganizes. Because at that point, you now want to backtrack a little bit to find out, oh, you're on your hormone therapy. Why are you on hormone therapy? What kind of hormone therapy? Now, that alone does not just affect this box number four. It will go back again to affect what? Your box number one, which is consultation. It will now show that your consultation was not ordered. And the chances are there as well that it will affect your box number three, which is time management. Because in going back and forth, you're going to lose time. And it will affect almost everything. Now in the examination, you find doctors who either they did not complete the examination, time is going, they abandon the patient midway, and then they have to, they want to run and start talking about management. So you see complete examination, you see some who do not have an idea how to use the equipment. They are usually not complex things. It might just be out of tension of the hour, or they do not have, the, they are not quite confident at, the, at that moment then they forget to pick up the instrument or they forget to put on the instrument. They forget to use it the right way. Okay. Or for an instance, while using the otoscope, while examining one ear, they forget to change the cone, you know, um, in the otoscope before examining the other side of the ear. These are the, the appropriate things you need to do while using the equipment. But if not used in that manner, it becomes inappropriate. Now, in diagnosis, it could be a wrong diagnosis, and then it could be pulling up inadequate range of differentials. Either it is inadequate. Maybe there are five common things that could present that way, and the examiner expects you to maybe mention those five things when they say discuss with the examiner the differentials. And then you mention one, you mention two, and then you are, maybe the person is, the, the examiner is even trying to show you yes and what else and what else, and then you're totally clueless about what else it could be. So that becomes inadequate, inadequate range of differentials. Now in your management, um, it could be in inappropriate management. You're managing a totally different condition from what the patient actually presented with. And this usually happens when the diagnosis is wrong. 
when you do not understand the history, you do not understand the examination of findings, you don't understand maybe the lab results, if it's applicable, and then you are giving management that's totally off what is expected, perhaps because the diagnosis was wrong. So these are common things that occur. Now, the management might not just be in a problem, it might be totally wrong. It might be not obtainable or not find in any medical book anywhere, or it might be even giving wrong information false information, okay? So wrong, and sometimes it might be appropriate for the condition, it might be correct in context, but it does not reflect best medical practices. So that means you just finished, you just stopped, maybe at admitting the patient, giving the patient the medical, um, the medication that the patient needs, and then you stop there, okay? So it does not reflect best practices, okay? Is this person lonely? Does this person need company? Okay, you're supposed to talk about how you are going to contact friends and relatives who could visit once in a while, just as an example. Okay, so those are things that reflect this practice. Your ability to attend to other issues beyond the medical that affects this patient. Okay. And the next one is rapport. Okay, do you build a good rapport with the patients? Poor rapport is a common uh, problem. Insensitivity to the patient's emotions or concerns. Yeah, not it doesn't happen very often, but yeah, you find sometimes some doctors lose their patients, lose their composure, might get angry, their voice tone might change, and they might even you know, fall out with the patient in those scenarios. So that's being insensitive to the patient's emotions or concerns. There are various other ways to be insensitive, you know. Some smiling while the patient is um, angry, while the patient is unhappy and expressing their displeasure and things like that. So you should always be sensitive and empathetic. Or using, yeah, stock fees. Okay, and maybe not seeking agreement to the, of the patient to the management plan. Now, in listening, you find some who miss those communication skills, verbal or non-verbal, who do not show that they are actively listening, like the example I gave earlier, and then who are not listening to the answers that the patients you know, have given to his or her earlier questions. And language using medical jargons, speaking too fast, and not giving time to the patient to express themselves. All right, now here we have some key points that a club, former club examiner expressed in his blog. So here you find um, the link to his blog. You should want to read them with a little bit more of um, explanations from him. But these are some very important key points that he thinks that if a doctor who wants to sit the club to exam pays attention to, will do very well. Now, number one is that you should be yourself. Just be a doctor. Don't be afraid. You have seen patients before. You have handled patients before. You should not be afraid of the exam. Now, the examiners themselves are doctors. They are just colleagues like you. Yeah, they are slightly more experienced. They have worked in the system here and all of that. But you should not come shivering. You should not come trembling. You know, you see doctors every now and then in your workplace. Just be yourself. Now, the chances are that if you are just yourself um, coming to the exams like every other working day, then you would likely perform like who you are, a doctor. That's who you are, you are a doctor. Just be yourself. Now, he also feels that um, communication is very key. And I dare to add to that that communication is the most important thing for your plateau exam. So you should spend more of your time communicating with the patient. What does that mean? Communicating to find out the problem. Communicating to understand the depth and context of the problem. Communicating to explain to them what you now think the problem is. And communicating to know what they would want to be done for them. Okay? And of course, communicating with them to know if they actually agree with what you think will be the best thing for them to do. Now, he also mentioned that you should take time to read your task. Take time to read your task. 
Now, I usually, I usually counsel people that um, if at the front of the cubicle, before you enter into the station, you read the task and maybe you did not understand it or the task is bulky, you were never able to slow it down, you were not able to finish reading it. When you go into the station, the task is also in the station. The task is right there in the station. It is better to use another one minute to read the task and understand it than to go ahead performing a task that may be totally off what was required. So take time to read your task. You'll be given the task in front of the cubicle to read before you go in. Okay, try to read it there, try to understand it, try to begin to strategize, try to you know, begin to formulate your approach um, while you are in the front of the station. And then when you go in, you would be able to attend to the patient appropriately. But if you do not understand, please go in, take a moment to read the task. Nobody penalizes, the examiners, don't, they do not penalize anybody. Um, for reading the task again or for excusing themselves to read the task again. There is no penalty for that. And then finally, he mentioned that you should track any changes close to your exam. You know, sometimes um, certain things around your exam might influence the kind of things that the GMC may want to focus on. They may upload certain updates about um, changes to the exam, okay? yeah. So you should track any changes close to your exams. Are there any adjustments um, that are likely to be made? So it helps to channel your energy in the line of what is likely possible um, or appropriate for that particular time. Now we'll quickly run through important communication tools, okay, in the PLAT2 consultation. All right. So um, sorry about that. I think I had a few slides mixed up. Okay. So um, let's quickly look at some important key points for an easy pass, okay? So these are very, very important key points that you need to pass. Now, for in your personal collection, believe that you can ace this exam. It all starts from your mind. You must believe that you can pass this exam, you to pass it. You know, there are many, many other doctors who would likely be on the same exam dates with you. You are a good doctor, they are good doctors as well. So you must come in confident for you to do well and stand a good chance of passing the exams. Now you might, you have to identify your natural weaknesses. Some of us have different challenges as persons that may affect um, how the outcome of these tests would be. For an instance, there are people who are very blunt, who are very direct, who maybe um, they have some challenges with their temper that, you know, if they meet an angry patient, they are likely to respond, you know, inappropriately. So knowing that this exam is testing your temper, so you should identify that natural weakness, knowing that your, your fuse is a bit short, and then you begin to work on that, on that. Some others have some other natural weaknesses. Let's say for an instance, and they speak very slowly. And because they speak very slowly, it will take them a longer time to take history. So you need to identify that. It is a weakness that is there. You must know and recognize that it is there so that you will be able to attend to it. If you do not, then that natural weakness will likely get the better part of you in the exam. So it could be language limitations. Maybe your English language is not so good. While the exam does not teach, test how good your English language proficiency is, that language 
can also affect how you communicate with the patient. So you must identify this and see how you can improve your language you know, with, um, as you prefer, prepare for the exam. So I mentioned some communication limitations, um, short temper, and then um, things like that. Now, timing. You should, uh, the best timing is dependent on you. So you should consider your circumstances, your financial situation, especially if you are coming from outside the UK to work, you're going to apply for visa. Do you have travel documents? Are your finances enough to, to, to uh, meet your travel requirements? Um, do you have leave from where you are working? You have to look at all that. So your timing in terms of when should you sit the exam? When should you start preparing and all of that? Dependent on you, okay? In fact, beyond all these external things like finances, travel documents, and all, it depends on you as a person, your pace of preparation. Some people need time to prepare. Some people can do well with preparing within a short time. But based on um, um, analyzing how others have prepared, usually we'll say that you should start active, intensive practice from about six weeks to your dates or your desired dates for the PAP2 test. So you might not have a specific date, yeah, but maybe when you have an idea when it is likely that you will sit for this test. So six weeks to eight weeks before then, you should start very intensive preparation. And that includes attending an academy. So of course you need materials. There are very important materials on the GMC website. Very few doctors go through these materials and it makes them not have an idea what the GMC expects of them. So you'll find on the GMC website, the PLAB, PLAB, the PLAB 2 blueprint. Uh, you also find the foundation program curriculum. Okay, these are important material that the GMC has made available to give you a scope of what they expect in the PLAB 2 test. Now, yes, you get materials from academy, okay, where you, there will be a discussion on a lot of content and um, they will also help you. So how do you prepare? Practice remains the best way to prepare for the plateau test. It is a practical exam. It is, an, it is a clinical exam. You have to appear physically. The examiner would see you. The patient would see you. So you must practice so that you come to replicate how much of the competencies you have gotten in your place of practice. Okay, so reading alone will not do the job. In fact, reading without practicing will only prepare you for surprises. You must practice. You must practice. So you might read them, understand the concept, but it is not enough. So you need to get practice partners, you know, preferably from the academy you attend. Yeah, so you, people you have, you know, try to um, um, attend the academy of courses, the classes together, you understand what is expected, you understood or at least learned in the same learning environment, you understood the peculiar approach of that particular academy, so to say, and then you have some kind of um, acquaintance relationship um, as professionals. So you can pick partners from there and then you make sure you practice. Now for academies, um, they provide guidance, they provide focused information that you need in the plateau exam. Now, all of that are all in advisory. None of them can guarantee any outcome. They can only guide you. Okay, this is how you should approach this station. This is how you should approach this other station. This is how you should do this. This is how you should do that. But how you do it at the end of the day, especially on your test day, is dependent on one person, and that is you. Okay, so you are your best academy. You are your best course. So you can attend these academies, you can attend these courses. They can give you some insight. They can help you understand a few things. They can give you a platform for seeking explanations when you're a bit challenged, when you're a bit confused about some things. Uh -huh. But you are your best um, academy and you determine the outcome. So passing or failing is dependent on one person and that is you. It's not your choice of academy. Okay, so try to match your needs with the strengths of your choice of academy. Okay, so for people who have not chosen what academy to attend, 
uh, what where to attend the MD Plateau course if you choose to. Some people do not attend the Plateau course to sit the exam. Okay, but you stand a better chance if you have someone to guide you. So try to look at your weaknesses. Do you have a challenge of time? Do you have a challenge of understanding? Do you have a challenge of experience? Then you want to look at what your challenge is and look through and see which academy can meet my challenges. So why am I spending time on this? Do not choose academics because your friend attended this or your, you know, somebody else attended the other one. Now, how do you know a good academy? The teachers must be experienced in teaching and in training okay so they should be able because the thing in teaching is one person being able to communicate knowledge in simple ways that the other can understand so you, you must have teachers who have an experience with teaching and know the teaching methods that suits the different stations now the teachers must be patient they should give you opportunities to practice in terms of mocks, okay? It should give you mocks for you to practice and of course, they'll put feedback based on what you have performed and say, okay, you are still weak in this area. You still have a challenge in this area. You should do this, you should do that, and then you, you will get better, okay? They should be able to follow you up until you pass your exam, okay? And um, of course, Key Points Academy offers all of these. Now, let's look at those important communication tools in a plateau consultation that we missed them slightly earlier. Okay, so um, the consultation starts with an initial approach. Okay, so this initial approach it sets the mood for the interaction with the patient, how you come in. You know, they usually say first impression matters. So this initial approach gives the patient a first impression of you. So you must start the station right. You must set the mood for the interaction. You know, don't forget that the examiners are looking for your rapport. This is where you establish a very good rapport with the patient. And then you need to connect with the patient or the relative and you enter the station very well so that the station will definitely flow well. You know, if the station does not start very well, it can determine the negative outcome of the station. So your initial approach is very, very important. You must start with confidence, you must start with kindness, you must start with empathy, you must start with um, everything good. You must start very right. Now let's um, look at the grips and soften approaches. You know, they actually help us summarize how to approach a station, how to enter a station, or how to even stay through the station with an appropriate attitude. Now, we'll start with the soft and soft and approach. It's, um, it says smile, you must come into the patient smiling, or at least show a sensitive and appropriate social uh, uh, disposition towards the patient. If the patient is, uh, in, of course, in a happy, friendly mode, you should come smiling, come uh, very friendly. If the patient is in pain or is in some discomfort or is ha unhappy, is angry, you should show a sensitive facial expression, definitely not to smile. You can't smile on somebody who is in pain. Okay, you must have an open posture. Okay, yeah, an open, friendly posture. Okay, you should lean forward, but not too forward. Okay, so leaning forward, of course, shows, yeah, I'm with you, I'm locked in, you know, you're trying to lock in uh, yourself with the, with the patient, it means I'm paying attention to you, okay. So you should touch, that's maybe give a handshake, yeah, um, if it is appropriate, usually in psychiatric cases, maybe when you read the task before you enter the station, you see that this person is uh, maybe a psychiatric patient, and then you are not sure this person is uh, stable enough to, to maybe come close to physically, so you may want to maintain a safe distance. But on a very ordinary and normal day, you may want to take a handshake. Um, sometimes some people feel it is inappropriate. Yeah, but of course you have to read the mood. That's why it has to be when it's appropriate. You have to read the mood. Uh, the patient might give you a hand. Of course, you want to take the hand as well. So maintain eye contact. This shows you are confident. It shows you know what you are doing. It shows that you are in 
child. You are not scared, you are not timid, you are not uh, intimidated by the patient. And of course, you also show that you are paying attention. It gives the patient that confidence that, yes, the doctor is with me. Okay, so you are not looking away, you are not looking down, you are not looking sideways, you are not looking up. You are looking right into the patient's eyes. Of course, not in a scary way, in a very friendly way that I am with you. Now, you should nod, okay? Especially in the history taking part of the station, when the patient is doing more of the talking and releasing information that you need to reach a diagnosis, you should nod, okay? To show that, yes, I am listening. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, talk to me. Now, let's look at a general um, overview of how to enter the station. Okay, and that's what this protocol tells us. Greet the patient, okay? And try to establish a rapport, okay? Greet the patient, hello, okay? How are you today, okay? I am doctor this and that, okay? Uh, may I confirm that you are Mrs. this and that? Or may I confirm your name and your age? So you introduce yourself and you try to identify the patient or the relative. Okay, may I confirm your relationship to Mr. A or B? Okay. Then you try to establish the purpose of consultation. What can I do for you today? How may I be of help today? Okay, oh, I understand that you were here last week and you had some investigations done and you came for the results today. Is that right? So you want to establish why we are having this conversation. Oh, hello, hi, I am Dr. Peter, one of the junior doctors in this department. How are you doing today? Okay, may I confirm that you are Mr. B and C? Yes, okay. Um, may I confirm that you are the father of so so and so in the world? Say yes, okay. So I understand that he had so so and so done and so so and so result is out and you'd want to know the outcome, is that correct? Yes, so we are trying to establish the purpose of consultation. Now, while doing all of this, you must, you must show an appropriate social courtesy. If you smile, if it is a very friendly, um, um, non-tense atmosphere, you should smile and be friendly, okay? If it is a sad, painful, unhappy, angry, dejected, depressed, worried, scenario you should show appropriate empathy okay yeah but of course you should not cry because the patient is crying you know but you should not be excited of course so you should respond to the patient's emotions yeah a good consultation must go beyond the signs and symptoms you must carry along the emotional component so you must manage the emotional state of whatever patient you are seeing. If the patient is excited, you should definitely not be too elated or too ex more excited than the patient. But of course, you should be happy for the patient's happiness. You should at least have that, that um, 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 emotion that mirrors what the emotion of the patient is. Now, for you to respond to the patient's emotions, you should be able to understand the emotions and concerns very well. And we have some acronyms that help us to at least elicit what the concerns, emotions, affectations, and perceptions are so that we'll be able to respond to them appropriately. So you have the eyes and the jazz. These are acronyms that we're going to look at just in a moment. Now, the EVE and PERS protocol, they help us to summarize how to respond to the patient's emotion. Now, don't forget the eyes and jazz help us to elicit the emotions, concerns, and perceptions. The EVE and PERS protocols help us to summarize how we respond. Now, the eyes protocol. I helps us to see what ideas do these patients have about their condition. What do they think? What are the concerns they have? Are they worried about something? Okay, what are they worried about? What are they concerned about? And what are the expectations 
from the consultation process. Is there something they expect? Is there something they want? And all of that. So the ICE protocol helps you. Okay. Ideas. Do you have any idea? Or what do you think may be the cause of this symptom? Okay. So concerns, is there anything you are particularly worried about? The expectations. So um, from all we have talked about, is there anything you are really looking out for from this consultation? Okay. So the second acronym, JAS, is um, an acronym that helps us to understand the effects of certain symptoms or a certain condition on the patient's life. So it helps us to look at these five critical areas that usually symptoms or clinical conditions can affect. It could be the job, it could be activities of daily living. Okay, have you been able to go to work or has it affected your work in any way? Okay, how has you have you been coping in your day? Have you been able to do the things you normally do in your, in your day? Um, how about your relationships? Okay, it could be relationship at home, it could be relationship with friends. Has it affected the relationships in any way? What about your sleep? Okay, and what about your sexual life? Has any of these symptoms or has this condition affected this in any way? So it gives you an idea, the areas, these critical areas of the patient's life that the condition may have affected. Then we we'll look at the EVE protocol. This helps us to respond. How do we respond? So E is to explore the emotions. Okay, to explore the emotions. It helps you to first of all identify what emotion is in play. I can see that you are quite um, uncomfortable with this, 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 and this. Or I can see that you are not quite satisfied with this, this, and this. So by identifying dissatisfaction, you're identifying unhappiness, and um, you want to explore. Okay. Now, when you understand the emotion, you you validate the emotions. Okay. Yeah, I can see that you're a little unhappy. I understand that anybody who has been treated in so so and so way, you know, will of course not be happy. So you are validating the emotion. You are saying, okay, this is a patient that is unhappy with management. Blood sample was misplaced, and this person is unhappy that um, they want to prick him or her again to get another blood sample. And the person is unhappy. The person is angry with management, or angry with the doctor, or angry with the lab, or angry with somebody in the management. So I can see that you are a bit upset about the development. I understand that anybody who is in this kind of situation, or whose blood sample must have been this, or who is subjected to another, you know, needle prick uh, to get a second sample, you know, would feel this way. I understand that. So you are validating, yes, your emotion is appropriate. I totally understand why you must be angry. Okay. So, of course, you show empathy. You show empathy. Okay. You show, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel this way. And then um, all of that. So the pair of protocol. Um, helps us to just um, outline the areas. You know, the EVE protocol actually does the job, but sometimes um, we would also have to look at the PEL just to understand the components, the components of responding to emotion. So you may want to come from an angle of partnership. How? Now, you, you try as much as you can to use us, we. Can we do this? Okay, yeah, I think we can, you know, so when you use those um, words of partnership, it helps to bring the patient close and help the patient to feel involved in what you are doing. You want to show empathy. You want to apologize when you are wrong or acknowledge that um, I acknowledge your friends or I can see that. Okay, so it shows you acknowledge and of course you are apologizing where you are wrong or where management is wrong. And then show respect at all time. Okay, respect, privacy, respect, whatever else that needs to be respected. Okay, to validate, like we mentioned in the EVE protocol, Okay, I understand that why you must feel this way. I understand that this might be quite, quite uncomfortable for you and all that. And of course, you always show support. I'm always here, I'm right here. You know, so, so 
all of that helps us to understand how to respond. Now, a few other things, signposting. Okay, this talks about giving the patient information or what we call warning signs to help them anticipate a change in the direction of conversation. Let's say, for an instance, we're trying to talk about the history of presenting campaign and trying to understand the symptoms that this patient is having. Okay, and then um, we get to a point where we want to switch to something more sensitive and more personal. Let's say you want to ask about the person's personal history, like sexual history, or you want to ask about something as sensitive as uh, maybe a history of cancer in the family or, or someone who has had a heart attack in the family before. So those are sensitive areas. So you might want to go do what? Give a warning sign, give the patient some information to let them know, I want to come into something slightly different from what we're talking about. It might be before you summarize. So you want to give that signpost to help the patient know that I am glad I'm actually ending this conversation or this part of the conversation. So what, what do we mean by that? Um, let's say for the first example, you want to switch to something sensitive. Okay, so um, thank you, Mr. James. Um, I want to ask you a few things um, regarding your personal history. Or I want to ask you a few things about your personal life or some private things about your sex, sexual life. So you have not asked the question, but you have prepared the person's mind. You have tried to give a warning sign. Or let's say before you summarize, you are now, of course, maybe you have picked up all the clinical information that you think is relevant towards the diagnosis, or you, you feel you have had more information enough in your history taking. I say, okay, thank you very much, Mr. James. So from what we have talked so far, okay, or what we have discussed so far, you know, let me put all of that together. Okay, so you are not ending the conversation abruptly, or you are hinting these patients to know that I am trying to package everything while we're coming to an end of this part of the con consultation. So you sign post before you summarize, and of course, it can occur in any other place as you find appropriate. Now, in summarizing, you, the, you would want to pick up the key points in the consultation, and that will include the positives in your history, in your examination, and any important negatives that will help you to rule out some clinical information uh, or some, some differentials that um, you think are not, um, are not it for that particular presentation. So, and of course, when you summarize, it also shows that you are demonstrating active listening skills. It shows that while the patient was talking, while you were taking history, while they were answering your questions, you were actually listening. So, if you're able to pick up, yes, you mentioned this, you mentioned this, you mentioned that. So, from what you told me, you said you had cough for the last three days, and then before then, you've been having fever. It's okay. So you mentioned that this cough about from yesterday, you were having some difficulty in breathing, and you are picking up those important information that the patients have mentioned. You are summarizing. Now, what does this do? It shows you are listening. What else does it do? It shows you are carrying the patient along because you are summarizing, and at the end of it, you are going to say, is there any other thing I missed? So you are bringing the patient in. You are allowing the patient to vet what you are doing. And of course, it shows the examiner that you are a good doctor. You are carrying the patient along. Now let's quickly look at an approach to history taking. Generally, how do you approach history taking? Now, this is an ideal consultation. I think I've talked about this slightly earlier. It should have an initial approach. Okay, you should establish the purpose of consultation. You should, um, of course, go into your history taking, try to understand the presenting complaint. And of course, that would include any symptoms that, that you know, are associated with that complaint as well. But you go in depth, go in and around the presenting complaint. Then you want to examine the patient, because in most of the cases, you would want to examine to have a better understanding of what is going on, and then you go to your diagnosis. It could be a provisional diagnosis, something temporary that you want to confirm. It could be something that you are suspecting. Maybe it all looks like cancer. So I'm suspecting, I can't say it is cancer yet, but you know, this is actually what I'm suspecting. It could be something serious. It could be something serious. And then in some cases, it could be definitive. So that means that your clinical diagnosis is enough to clinch that diagnosis, okay? And then you may need to do some investigations. You know, sometimes, you need it you know, to come before the diagnosis. 
Yeah, there are cases like that where you can only suspect and then you may have to do this investigation before you diagnose. In some other cases, you may have to make the diagnosis before the investigations. So in that case, the investigations may just help to inform your management and not necessarily to uh, not necessarily to help you reach the diagnosis. Okay, and then of course your management, very detailed management showing best practices in um, consultation. And let's look at the history taking outline. Um, you use your P3 Maftosa. Okay, P3 Maftosa is an acronym that helps to outline the areas in your history taking um, um, outline. So what do they mean? The P are three, the P, there are three P's. So that is your, the presenting complaint, past medical history, and personal history. Personal history here refers to the sexual history or history of something like um, uh, recreational drugs. Those are things that are personal to the patient and they're a bit private. Okay, so you would always, almost always, you have to sign post before you ask about personal history, okay? So I want to ask you something a bit more personal, okay? And I want to know a bit more about your sexual life because it will help me understand what could be going on. Is that all right with you? So when you sign post, you sign post with a request to continue. Okay, so the next is your medication history. So you want to find out about any, any history of any medication, person taking any medication, that do they have any allergies? Then family history. So you can see the first letters of each of these. They are going towards. They are, they are helping us understand the P three. Okay. Allergy history, family history, travel history operational history, uh, social, and your social history, you want to know about them. If the person is smoking, the person is skin alcohol, and of course you quantify to know if it's significant or not. You want to know about their diet, and then you also want to know about exercise. Then any other information, is there anything else apart from all of these that I've asked? So it might be any other information from you based on the interaction with the patient. You have seen that the pain of maftosa, of course, in many cases would have done the job, but there may be one or two other things you think you need to ask. So you can ask at this point, or you can even open it up to the patient. Is there any important, anything you think, you know, I need to know apart from this, okay? So before this additional information, you may want to summarize and post and summarize and ask, is there anything else? Okay, so, or you can ask, is there any other thing else before you summarize? So either way, it works. So, but you get that the additional information gives room for anything that you may be missing or anything that the PIM of Prosa, um, while you were asking it, was not able to elicit. Now, in pediatrics history, um, of course, it goes, it is still history taking, like um, you have in P3 Maltosa, but there are parts of that history that are peculiar to a child in terms of um, um, the child's development, maybe before the child was born, while the child was born, how the child adapted in their first few days of life, and all of that. So these acronym binds helps us to understand these important aspects of a child history. So you want to know about the birth, birth history. How was the child born? And that starts from even the pregnancy, okay? How was the pregnancy? Was there any problems, okay? How was the child born? Was it um, vaginally or was it a viral cesarean section? Is there any reason why? Okay, did the child at the time of birth was there any problem? Okay, so you want to find about find out about that. So immunization history: Is the child up to date in the immunizations? Has this child been receiving his or her jabs? How is the feeding so far? Does they have any feeding problems? Is he eating well? Does he have any allergies to any foods? and all of that, then everything about nutrition. You want to find about neonatal history as well. In the first one month of life, okay, how did the child cope? Was there any problem? And then the development history. How is the Red Book? The Red Book helps patient and parents to keep tabs 
on um, the developmental milestones of this pay of the patient of um, the child okay so you want to find out about that how the development so far are you worried about this child development in any way okay and then the social history so all of these will um, uh, cover this important area that affects children now in take history for um, pain of course or and headache of which headache of course comes um, like a pain okay so in taking history for pain we use the acronym socrates okay and what does it mean socrates this s is for sight it helps you to find out the location of the pain and usually you let the patients know can you show me with the finger where this pain is Oh, is on my back, okay? Would you like to show me with a finger where exactly? Okay, so it helps you to identify. Because sometimes they may tell you back pain, but actually it is a flank pain. And if the patient does not show you with a finger, you might not know that this patient is having parallel nephritis, and you would be thinking that it could be something right in the spine at the back, and you are totally thinking of something else while the patient is talking about something else. So you want this patient to show you with the finger where is this pain. Now onset, when did this start? Okay, so you want to know the timing of the onset. You also want to know um, the nature of the onset. Was it sudden? Was it gradual? Okay, you want to find out the character of the pain. Can you help me describe this pain? Do you think is it dull? Is it sharp? Is it burning? Is it crushing? Is it piercing? Is it colic? I mean, does it come and go? Okay, so you want to know about the radiation. Does the pain go elsewhere? Okay, so apart from apart from here, where you just showed me, does it go elsewhere? You want to know if there are other associated factors. Of course, by now, depending on the presentation and response of the patient, you already have an idea what the possibilities are. So you, at this point, you want to ask about your differentials. Okay, you want to ask about some defining questions for all those conditions that you think is likely to give what the patient is describing so far. So you ask them, you want to know about the timing. Okay, is there a time cost? To this, okay, because is any time it gets better, is any time it gets worse. It could be morning, it could be evening, it could be when you wake up, it could be towards the evening. All of that helps you to understand what conditions could give you this kind of timing. And then you want to know is there anything that makes it worse, is there anything that makes it better, and you want to score pain, okay, where one is the least pain and ten is the worst of the, the worst pain. How would you score this pain? Of course, if the patient tells you eight, nine, ten, that is severe, and that will tell you that you need to do something urgently. You want to offer painkillers, you want to, you want to do whatever you need to do, depending on the case, for this patient to be comforted. You must always relieve a patient of pain. Now, the next one is Odipara. Okay, it's another acronym that helps us to take history in other symptoms apart from pain. Socrates is for pain, Odipara is for most of the other symptoms. Of course, I will tell you another exception. So the O is for the onset, D is for duration. How long has it been? Okay, the progression. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Okay. You will find that is anything that makes you worse is anything that makes it better and then shared symptoms. So by now you have an idea, you already know the onset, you already know how long it will be, you already know that it's getting worse or it gets worse, it gets better, or it's just the same. You already have an idea, oh this makes it worse, this makes it better. Then you want to check as shared symptoms. What other symptoms could be close to or usually occurs with this particular symptom, then you want to find out. And from there, you begin to rule out and rule in possible causes of that condition. Now, you must note that an exception to this is um, seizures and collapse situation, where you want to find out what happened before 
what happened during and what happened after. So in this case, you are not just doing secrets or the para, you are trying to understand the incidents. We call this the incident history. We want to find out. So before this happened, how were you? Okay, or what was happening? Or what happened before this? Okay, so how was your health before this? What were you feeling before this? Did you know this was going to happen? Whatever. So you want to find out everything that happened before the incident. Now, during the incident, were you conscious? Okay, so if you were conscious, what happened? Can you describe what happened? If the person was unconscious, okay, so um, do you know if anybody was around? Yeah, okay, my wife was around, okay. So what did your wife say? Or if the wife is there, you want to find out from the wife what happened during, okay? Oh, he fell, he collapsed, and then he passed out. Uh, he was unconscious for two minutes, so he was unconscious for eight seconds, and all that and all that. So you want to find out what happened during and then after. So when you woke up, what's the first thing you remember that you saw? What's the first thing that you observed? What, 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 what? Okay, okay. I noticed that I peed on myself. I noticed that um, I passed some stool and on myself and all that. So it gives you an idea that all some urinary and fecal incontinence in the process of this seizure or this collapse. And of course, it gives light to your suspicions, your diagnosis. So, Thank you very much. Um, oh, oh.